we construct a mighty legacy of our own with intellect, compassion, fairness, and morality, respect for our human dignity,
people never lost pride in being Jewish. They teach their children themselves at a very young age about their history, about the Holocaust, and they vow never to forget. They honor their ancestors. They honor their foreparents. They honor that journey despite the horrific trauma, and they teach the world about the horrors committed. Do they not? Everybody has heard of the Jewish Holocaust. No matter where I go in the world, when I ask an audience who's heard of the Jewish Holocaust, everybody's hands go up. The African Holocaust, however, was the largest forced migration of a people in the history of mankind. You see, the Jewish Holocaust happened in Europe, and the African Holocaust happened right here in this country and throughout the world. And young people, it is your duty to learn from your Jewish brothers and sisters and honor your ancestors and foreparents too. Become the authors, producers, directors, songwriters, whatever it takes. It's our duty to honor them. And a question comes to mind. What was the civil rights movement effective? What did we accomplish? And as forward-thinking college students, do we truly understand the road of our past? Do we understand who we are, who you are, your purpose in life, the significance of your identity? I also teach at home in New York at the at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and my students and I talk about this all the time, the importance of compassion, the importance of our identity. It's all extremely important, especially compassion, compassion, compassion. Michelle Alexander writes in her book entitled The New Jim Crow that not much has changed from the times of the 1950s in the civil rights movement. In fact, statistics and even our news show that times for us are worsening. According to the statistics in the 1970s, 300,000 blacks were incarcerated. Today, more than 2.3 million of our black and brown brothers and sisters are incarcerated, locked up behind bars. Well, well, well. And what can we do about it? Do we care? Mm. As a society, do we care? As a people, do we care? Young, unarmed black youth senselessly slaughtered by officers. Trayvon Martin, Carlos Mercado, Eric Garner, Tanisha Anderson, Walter Scott, and the list goes on and on and on. It's nothing new. It's the smartphones that allow us to see just a small percentage of the injustices that are rampant in our society. However, I must commend this generation of young people who came together as brothers and sisters. You came together with your compassion and care. You came together and expressed discontent and skillful use to organize yourselves through social media and to educate the masses on important human rights issues, creating slogans such as Black Life Matters. You utilize the power you possess as brothers and sisters in unison and young people, we must give you a hand. Amen. Much like the days during the enslavement of our people, when we saw uprisings resulted to decapitated and lynched bodies, or during Jim Crow and civil rights, when younger and older nonviolent organizers, demonstrators, protesters, seeking a better quality lifestyle with their humanity was respected. While fire extinguishers and dogs are being sicked on these helpless Americans, today, peaceful organizers and protesters for the Black Lives Matters movement are being arrested and charged with misdemeanors and felonies. An American citizen can now be deemed an enemy combated and held indefinitely without charge just for protesting. So this is what's happening to the Black Lives Matters movement. But you have to be persistent. And so with this great movement, you must understand that creating hashtags and slogans does not make you an activist. It does not. 
Ashe. It does not mean that your job is done. You must understand history and look to those before you and understand that they came together, they planned, they strategized, organized amongst themselves yes. together. We must look to them for direction because ladies and gentlemen, our job is not done. Every day we're challenged by witnessing the disrespect and disregard of our black and brown bodies, of our lives. Just recently we saw a young 15 year old girl savagely removed from her seat hmm. with such force that her chair flipped over her in one direction while her body was thrown in another. Hmm. And we have to do something about that. We have to do something about that. She does not deserve that. Some people are saying, well, she deserved it. She was disrespecting her teacher. But that is unacceptable behavior. And so with the Black Life Matters campaign, I must ask each of you, how specifically does your life matter? Nelson Mandela said, not until a man has done what he considers to be his duty for his people and his country can he then rest in peace. Mm. My father was just in his 20s when the world would learn of him. Not many years older than most of you here this evening. You all look like you're in your teens. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of people don't realize that my father was such a young man. You know, people talk about, oh, he changed when he went to the Middle East. He didn't change. He just grew up. He evolved. He was the same compassionate man, the same person who was compassionate. Brother Malcolm, just in his 20s, stood up and against the injustices around him. While other young men and women were also organizing demonstrations, protests, marches, and sit-ins, seeking to end the outright terrorism around them, seeking a quality of life for themselves and their families, integrating schools and public housing. Malcolm, just in his 20s, said, we demand our human rights as your brother. Man. We demand our inalienable human rights ordained by God. He did not compromise his stance for the sake of money, for the sake of simply being rich. He did not demand with hashtags and slogans and think his job was complete. Well, He saw himself as a reflection of you. And he lived his entire life serving his country, serving his people, serving God. Man. He read everything that was available so he was fully equipped to educate the masses, to inform his colleagues, to have discussions and create strategies in search of solutions to the human condition that would want to destroy his fellow brother and sister simply because of ethnic, religious, or gender differences. The climate of our nation was hostile to the humanity of African Americans. Jim Crow, separate but unequal, was the law of the land. Private citizens and organizations terrorized black people, similar to what's happening today without fear of repercussion. The African diaspora was unprotected and essentially without hope for change. And yet in a humble submission to God, Malcolm X stood up and stepped forward. Otherwise, he said, to lead us into an egalitarian future. But not much has changed young people since that time. The only thing that's changed is that we have smartphones and social media. Young people, you are brilliant, bold, and compassionate just to be here at Texas Southern University. This is your time. Your time to invest in yourselves by any means necessary, with a quality education, with significant purpose to your lives with utilizing compassion and power to be your absolute best, fully evolved human beings, utilizing all of your senses of compassion, humanity, and justice. Mm. People often ask me what it's like to be a daughter of Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz. I was raised proud to be of the African diaspora, proud to be a woman, 
and proud to be a Muslim. I was raised understanding the importance of education and history, the importance of humanity, the importance of leadership and self-reliance, that I am my brother and sister's keeper, to be my best so I may give of my best to my community and our society at large, the importance of power, my power. As a child, I recall watching my mother work in the cause of human rights. I remember her participating in the International Women's Conference that was held in China shortly before she passed away. When I was at my lowest, writing my first book, Growing Up X, afforded me an opportunity to reflect on her life as a source of inspiration and strength. She had given so much love and direction that I wanted to share with others, and so Growing Up X was my coming-of-age memoir. But with six daughters, boys ringing our doorbells and weekly episodes of Soul Train and the Brady Bunch, <laughs> Growing Up X is likely not what most people expect of the family of Malcolm X. <coughs> My father was a compassionate man, loving man. Mm -hmm. And most people thought differently. Did you have a different perception of Malcolm X when you were growing up? Man. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> No justice, no peace? Well, it would still be that. You know, but that comes from compassion. You know, Amen. you have to understand Malcolm was just in his 20s. You know, and he got all these values from his parents. You know, my, my second, my children's book uh, talks to uh, the values, the role of his parents. His, his family, they sought after, they sought to destroy his family. His father was the president of the Garvey movement. He was responsible for the Marcus Garvey Movement, Universal Negro Improvement Associate, Universal Negro Improvement Association in the 1920s, commanded millions of followers in the 1920s. And Malcolm's father was the president of the, the uh, chapter in his in, in, uh, in, in Wisconsin, I think it was. And when Marcus Garvey was arrested, it was Malcolm's father who wrote a letter to President Coolidge at the time and suggested that they let Marcus Garvey out of jail for these supposed mail fraud uh, charges, and they let uh, Garvey out of jail. Mm -hmm. And that Malcolm's mother was the national recording secretary for this organization. Her uncle, Egger, Egerton, uh, was one of the co-founders with Marcus Garvey of this movement. So Malcolm came from a family of activists. activists. And I had read so many books that said Malcolm's mother was crazy and, you know, mentally disturbed and that. Malcolm's father was, you know, just a carpenter and all of these things. But it was the role of his parents that prepared him so that when they killed his father, when they took his mother and put her in an institution, when they separated the siblings, that Malcolm still had that foundation that his parents took the time to instill in all of their children. And so all of that is absolutely important. It's the reason that I wrote my books, because I want to make sure that I record that information accurately, just as all of us have to do our parts. Amen. If we want to honor our ancestors properly, only we can do that. No one else is going to do that for us. And so I, I wanted to make sure that the truth of Malcolm's foundation, he didn't go to jail and miraculously become this you know, icon or this human, human rights activist. But my mother was, in, was a young woman in her 20s when she witnessed the political assassination of her husband. <coughs> One week prior on Valentine's Day, a Molotov cocktail, and, and for those of you who don't know, it's a bomb, was thrown into the nursery of my father and mother's home where my sisters and I slept as babies. And so if you watch Spike Lee's movie X, You'll recall that my father was staying in busy hotels shortly after the firebombing of his home because he wanted to keep the attacks away from his family, away from his young wife and children who were near and dear to his heart. When my father was finally killed, my mother was left traumatized, frightened, and alone. She was a young woman with four babies and pregnant with my youngest sisters, the twins. And I've often asked myself, 
with six babies, widowed, and the wife of Malcolm X, the wife of the man who challenged a government that was historically unjust to its own people. How was this young woman, Sister Betty, able to overcome such a loss and so many obstacles, and still raise six daughters, and still dedicate her life to significantly giving back to others, and still earn a master's degree, because she already had a bachelor's and nursing degree when she married her husband, and then get into her car once a week to drive from our home in New York to the University of Massachusetts and earn a PhD. There's no excuses. There are no excuses. And so this woman, Sister Betty, she never accepted no or I can't as an answer for herself. Sister Betty survived because of her faith in God and because she understood the power in knowing her history, which sustained her. She knew the importance of self-respect, self-esteem, and not compromising her values and standards as a woman of the African diaspora. Sister Betty was very clear that she would not just sit back, complain, and think that someone else was going to help her. Someone else was going to come and rescue and resolve these issues. When you know your history, you understand this. You understand the challenges of injustice and the power you possess to invest in yourselves and your communities. My mother raised six girls with the knowledge of history, education, and religion as a means to develop a healthy identity, self-respect, and with an understanding of our obligation to others. Forget what they say about pulling your individual selves up by your own bootstraps, because it doesn't work. We must subscribe to the African proverb that it takes a village to raise a child. Amen. We need one another. We need strong, educated soldiers, strong, educated, and supportive brothers and sisters coming together as one. Each and every one of us must advocate as a community. My father's power jolted the complacency of our nation as he articulated demands for freedom and equality 50 years ago that could not be ignored. Malcolm's impassioned leadership still inspires us to stand as he insisted upon liberty and justice for all. He created a plan of action that would empower America to achieve her greatest potential. In the 12 short years immediately preceding his assassination, this young Malcolm X rose to the defense of African Americans victimized by race discrimination. He challenged notions of white supremacy and entitled entitlement. He redefined the American Civil Rights Movement to include a human rights agenda. And he worked tirelessly to unite Africa and the diaspora towards a singular international struggle for freedom and independence. He taught us that blacks were not Negroes because there's no such place as Negro land. <laughs> that we were African Americans from the African continent. He's regarded globally as one of the greatest and most brilliant human rights strategists of the 20th century. Failure to adopt his initiatives to end oppression has increased the economic, political, and social divides worldwide. If we allow ourselves to be divided and separated and not see ourselves as one, the attack against our children will continue. My father said, when you teach a man, you teach a community. And when you teach a woman, brothers, you raise a nation. Yes. So we really have to understand our roles. Brothers, your women are a reflection of you. Your power lies within her. We need everyone in the equation of raising and protecting our children. 
My father said societies are measured by the progress of its women, gentlemen. So if your women are, aren't acting right, or if there's something that's a little off balance, then we need our men to step in. My father was compassionate, a student, a lover of books, an excellent teacher, and he stood tall to restore our identities and to help us know that long before there was a Harvard or a Yale, and West Africa, there was the University of Timbuktu. Amen. Where black Amen. scholars conferred degrees to citizens of the world who specifically came to the continent for knowledge. As you heard, I was a project advisor for the award-winning PBS film, Prince Among Slaves. Prince Abdur Rahman was one of the most famous African men ever captured in the history of the slave trade. And what made this documentary so powerful is that this was the first documented history from an African perspective. And this gentleman happened to be one of the greatest African rulers before the continent was cut up into small countries and colonized. And so it was in the 1700s that Prince Abdur Rahman recalled that the United States was by no means comparable to the land in Africa from whence he came that the United States was underdeveloped, that it was a pagan society, that the homes were poorly constructed all by comparison to the land over which he presided on the continent of Africa. In the 1700s, this infamous Prince Abdur Rahman said that most Africans were Muslim, that they spoke five to seven languages, that thriving cultures were based upon universal spirit and intellect, God and scholarship, morale and wisdom.